Hi all, I have another fascinating game example to show you today of the Shebenenko Slav and it's another game of Alexei Shirov I want to show you this time against Vector Korshnoi who's often very dangerous with the white pieces this is in 1996 in the Horningen Horen tournament in the Netherlands so the G is silently uh, pronounced apparently so Horningen I think that's close. So d4 from Victor anyway. We have d5, c4, c6, knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, and now this a6. And Korshnoi chooses g3, and we see another perk of this a6, which is b5, very aggressive. If white takes on b5, a takes, kind of activates the rook at least. So white plays this dark square clamp, c5. So it's a great way of getting some imbalances. It looks very provocative, as if giving white extra space and clamping on the dark squares but at least it's creating imbalances which you can use to, to potentially win the game because these have downsides this kind of construction it could turn out to be overextended so we have g6 which looks fairly logical to try and maybe target e5 later with a thin chateau bishop bishop g2 bishop g7 knight e5 that does tie down this knight to c6 right now we see black casting White castles, bishop e6, and now h3. And now queen c8 looking at h3. And actually we have g4, very aggressive. So not king h2, but g4, this was the idea. h5, f3. So keeping pretty solid there, it seems. And we have now uh, knight h7, which is very, very interesting. It's encouraging g takes h5. And is that a vulnerable pawn if black has to recapture? Caution, I did test this. g takes h5. After g takes king h2. Uh, knight d7. And yes, white's piece that has spent time getting to e5 is exchanged off for a piece which has just come out of base. So that's interesting. So can actually black claim to be reaching equality here? It seems pretty solid already. Rook g1, king h8 e3 so Korshnoi's plan here is very interesting he wants to play f4 which uh, we'll look at h5 so rook g8 f4 looking at h5 the knight comes to protect we see queen e1 interestingly there are some specific tactics in this position if queen e1 wasn't played if e4 there is a specific tactical resource bishop g4 for example uh, if it's avoided then black gets a reasonable position like this that should be uh, fine for black. And if it's not avoided, this piece out here, uh, so h takes g in this line. This is quite fascinating. The king is actually exposed, as well as, yeah, there's, there's possibilities for black to be really doing fantastically well. So anyway, queen e1 was played, not e4. e4 is a bit of a loosening move. This construction uh, seems fairly stable at the moment. So queen e1 is the point in Korshnoi's view. So bishop h6, we see queen h4 getting quite aggressive with the queen tying down things. We see now rook g7, bishop d2, and now rook a g8, knight e2, and then we see rook h7. Curious, you might think. Rook h7 is something brewing here tactically on g4, if we look at this position. We see bishop f1, knight e4, offering an exchange of rooks that is accepted that offer and now rook d1 clearly if queen takes h5 well not clearly i'll just show it off to you queen takes h5 there is the trick i hope you can spot it if i give you five seconds what does black play here okay bishop takes f4 check discovers an attack on the queen and that will be a big advantage materially there's no backfire there so that's brilliant for black so rook d1 we see bishop f5. Uh, there was actually a magnificent uh, resource here, which which engines pick up, um, which is bishop g4. If hg, hg, there's a, there's a funny one of the king g1. Can you see what black plays here to actually get a winning advantage? If I give you five seconds to pause the video here, I thought this was kind of amusing, this resource. Okay. There's bishop g5, and I hope you see the follow-up. So it's looking a uh, double attack against the queen, and the queen is kind of checkmated after queen e1, bishop h4. There's no escape for the queen there. So I thought that was an amusing one. So anyway, bishop f5 was played. 
instead uh, it's still very nice for black Bishop g2 Queen e6 and now caution gives up that light square Bishop this is something which we often live to regret sometimes when we give up uh, a Bishop to be suffering on that color complex later uh, on the other hand if rook g1 here then uh, in fact uh, knight takes d2 is possible believe it or not because bishop takes d5 discovered check winning the queen isn't so winning as you'd think because there is a bit of a sting in the tail here after bishop takes there's knight f3 yeah weakness of the last move full king king queen and black ends up winning there so unfortunately uh you know rook g1 doesn't work leaving uh, the bishop hanging there for a moment and bishop c1 instead uh bishop g7 this this position is fine for black uh but that's an interesting alternative at least for white if white doesn't want to depart with the light square bishop so we have this uh bishop takes e4 queen takes e4 and the queen does seem to have a lot of interesting invasion possibilities on uh the light squares here uh, so we see rook g1 check here again if you know queen takes then bishop takes f4 is winning the queen clear cut so rook g1 check rook g7 and now knight g3 here this is slightly more interesting this consideration of queen takes h5 by the way instead of knight g3 if queen takes h5 can you see what black would do here which kind of yeah it creates a kind of pin and win scenario basically uh can you see the move which would lead to a sort of winning pin here if i give you five seconds here what would you play with black in this position okay it seems it turns out queen d3 is pretty crushing if uh bishop e1 then actually queen c2 believe it or not this pin is pretty lethal or winning material generally so if queen takes here then taking and then bishop e4 that's the end of white's king uh if bishop f2 then rook g6 and here uh it's just very very nice for black what what is white actually doing here uh for example this position is going to be bad on the light squares for white it's it's very very uh nice for black to have this kind of position so anyway knight g3 was chosen here at move 29 and we have queen c2 rook g2 bishop e4 and trading off this leads to simplification so is this end game enough for black to have an advantage still so after d takes we have queen f2 perhaps white could have improved here with queen e1 there is a specific idea with this advanced c pawn to be aware of when you play uh chemilenko slav in, in the end games that could be sometimes dangerous queen one actually reflects that this pawn might be uh, a little bit dangerous because if queen takes b2 here can you see what white could play and this is why sometimes you really want to look at whole games as a sort of tests of opening theory because openings might have implications for endgame so this is an interesting uh, illustrative game and, and the variation here to demonstrate something in particular white could play what to equalize here at least if I give you five seconds okay d5 yeah let's have an objective reality you know there is some pluses for white of this uh, c pawn here it, it can crash through uh, potentially uh, so for example if c takes then that's it's gonna be a disaster actually uh, white actually crashes through with that pawn yeah, he's gonna play Queen d8 uh, and if uh, Queen f6 Bishop c3 this is gonna be at least equal so yeah uh, Queen e1 might have been a saving resource here it seems uh, but uh, unfortunately Victor played Queen f2 and after Queen takes b2 it's it's big trouble actually uh, there isn't the d5 resource here like that there was before white tries Bishop a5 swapping off Queens uh, to maybe yeah try and get the king over later to take c6 out to what Queen this is a bit slow though if d5 here instead 
C takes, and there's simply Queen C2. Uh, there's no fun and games there. Uh, sorry, just just to recap, by the way, in the other line on on the Queen E1, if we looked at this Queen C2 business, uh, if we looked at uh, 34 C takes. If we looked at Queen C2 here, I should have shown you this. There is Queen C1 simply. That's the point. And you can see that that runaway pawn, yeah, it can be dangerous end games. That's why actually it's very important to, to show this variation. So anyway, let's go back to the, the main line of the game. So Queen takes B2, Bishop A5, offering the exchange of Queens. And we have Queen takes F2, King takes E6. And there's a lot of work to do here still. This requires precision. Bishop d8, king g7. But uh, a lot of people, I hope you're aware that um, Shirov played one of the most amazing endgame master pay, uh, pieces in chess history. So he's good at endgames generally and past pawns, very good, and can be very dynamic. We have the king coming up to g6 and to f5. And it's here after bishop c7 some real accuracy is needed sure playing a move which actually uh computers really like actually bishop g7 if he plays f6 here it turns out this might not be enough f6 to play uh potentially well as an example like this it's it's not enough this the bishop holds here that should be even so that's not enough that idea if we look at that again with f6 and say e5 uh, this is not uh, enough basically this is even as well so bishop g7 has some extra options behind it not just f6 and e5 but also the, the idea potentially of playing the bishop inside the position to e3 if the white king's really trying to celebrate the advanced c pawn by knocking out c6 it will be leaving e3 behind so this is an interesting idea just to celebrate the king leaving e3 behind to play bishop g7 here uh, we see king c3 uh, so if bishop e5 is an example then actually just taking here and a5 to lock out the king from the b4 square uh, and then f6 and this is instructive because this shows that in end games this kind of pawn by itself could lead to being zugzwanged uh, we're going to get a zugzwang you know it's going to fall off or just fall off right here uh, if king e2 instead then f6 and then e5 and then this position is just clearly uh, much better for black uh, so yeah it's it's tricky stuff but this seems to be a super accurate move what was played uh, so this uh, bishop g7 so we see king c3 bishop f6 so heading for that e3 pawn essentially king b4 so the king's really left e3 behind bishop h4 in the art of war they say the good fighter you know puts themselves beyond defeat before going on the attack but here that there's there's kind of less and less choices in this end game as uh yeah it progresses so king a5 it has left behind a seed of defeat here the king bishop f2 and in fact victor cautionary resigned here without further ado actually uh just to play this out a scenario from this position so why did cautionary resign here if king takes a6 as an example bishop takes and uh taking out you know to avoid black having a pass pawn there as well so taking out c6 a bit more slowly than one would hope for and coming back the thing is uh this kind of position is uh is going to be lost because black has winning pass pawns here after f4 it's the bishop's just no good against these pass pawns so I'll take you to the game M position and uh, you know let's think about what we get from this uh, philosophically this this game it's interesting against the G3 uh, system well the first point is to use B5 to really encourage this C5 it really forces basically uh, an imbalance which will persist towards end games 
where is that pawn going to be weak or is it going to be a dangerous pass pawn uh, can white prove it could be you know kind of a useful dangerous pass pawn later so it's interesting this b5 to force that kind of imbalance early on and then later it seems as though yeah the rooks were curiously placed for for attacking possibilities uh the light squares became very interesting after white gave up the light square bishop in some of the variations there it seems uh the infiltration of the queen was picking up material and yeah caution i didn't seem to have too much uh counterplay with his plan it seems on this occasion okay so i hope you got something from it if you want to check out some core lines in this uh slav variation which you might not have played before with this early a6 chebelenko as it's called for a6 it's very very interesting shirov definitely has good results with it he seems to be uh, a pretty good model exponent to check out his games actually with so we've just checked out two so far so i hope you found them kind of interesting and insightful and if, so this free short and sweet course you can check out at king's crusher tv uh, slash chebslav so check that out uh, a fantastic grandmaster has presented uh, a great course there a free short and sweet one to check out some core cool lines if you want to try it in your games okay comments questions likes shares subscribes with the notification bell always appreciated thanks very much chess is an exercise in awareness it is evolution in motion. I evolved. This is where I am today. I like the feeling of strength that the pawn on d5 gives me. It feels like building a castle, a fortress. The pawn goes to d5. It is supported by his brother on c6. The knight comes to f6 for more stability. The bishop goes out to f5 as a guard outside the gate. Eventually, the pawn on e6 forms a triangle for the safest pawn structure in the center. It gives me confidence for the upcoming battle. This is the Chebanenko Slav.